if a person changes his religion from Islam to any other religion, the punishment should be death. I was attacked from nowhere. I didn't see it coming. I knew I had to get out or that was it. What do you think your brother will do if they find out you're an atheist? Kill me, maybe. This is Nisar Hussein, a father of six. In November last year, he was going to his car when this happened. Two hooded men brutally beat him to the ground. He was left with broken bones and hospitalized. He says he was attacked because he left the faith of Islam and converted to Christianity. Since then, he says he's faced continual harassment from his local Muslim community in the north of England. In the months leading up to the attack, Mr. Hussein placed hidden cameras around his home, filming what he felt were threats against him and his family. Do you feel like it's been an active religious hate campaign to cleanse you out, essentially? Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, actually, because as soon as my conversion seems to have spread like wildfire, and then before you know it, you're, sh you're shunned, isolated, and then treated with contempt. At the 2000 onwards, had three cars written off, almost daily abuse, intimidation, harassment, bricks thrown through the bay window, sworn at, spat at. My wife, especially with my daughters, being intimidated, harassed, and then things are escalated to such a degree that you literally are having to flee for your lives, actually. The, the attack was actually very sudden, and I just saw this thug just swing this pickaxe handle straight from my head, and I put my hand up to block it, actually, and my hand suffered fractures, and I reeled backwards and ended up falling, and then being concussed, being pummeled, and I suffered a fracture to my kneecap. We have lived with death threats and threats to our welfare and safety. I, I never really envisaged it. it would come in such a fashion just outside my front gate. Nisar Hussein is one of many Muslims choosing to leave Islam. Around the world, people who leave the Islamic faith can face state persecution and also violence at the hands of their local communities. So informal networks have come together linked by social media to help ex-Muslims who are in danger. Vice News has gained access to the London-based group Faith to Faithless. It started by me thinking that I was the only one in the world who had left Islam, because I didn't know you could do that. And um, quickly I realized, online at least, that that's not true. As I started meeting one person, 10 people, 20 people, I realized how many people there were, and then it kind of, it did snowball. It just went like, you know. So what kind of problems were you dealing with? emotional uh, abuse, people being kicked out by their families, uh, a lot of psychological trauma. As an example, this Ramadan that just finished, uh, I had to deal with five different attempts at suicide, and just, just in one month. But on the extreme side, it's things like kidnapping, forced marriage, risk from their family, or the wider community. Although Faith to Faithless is very private, Sarah is one person prepared to speak openly. She says she lost her faith around the age of 12 and things came to a head two years ago. So when I was 17, um, I had a boyfriend, my first boyfriend. Um, and unfortunately, my parents found out um, quite early on into the relationship as well. Um, and basically my parents threatened me with they're going to pull me out of college, they're going to marry me off. It felt like lockdown and I knew I had to either get out or that was it. So I didn't really have anywhere to go. They'd already taken away anything I could use to contact anyone else. But luckily, uh, while I was actually um, looking for a way to uh, kill myself, actually, I found uh, my old phone, which had some old numbers in. I left, I literally ran out of the house through fields as far as I could. Now I talk to my family and I kind of feel like we don't need each other anymore. 
and we're never going to be quite right again. So that's quite difficult. But um, yeah, I have had quite a few suicide attempts since. Unfortunately. Since leaving your parents' house? Since leaving, yeah. When you were back then, you were 17? Yeah. It's mainly loneliness. Um, feeling lonely, feeling like no one wants you, no one needs you. As serious as the situation can be in the UK, for ex-Muslims living abroad, the repercussions can be even worse. A comprehensive report released by a humanist organization stated that in 13 countries across the world, all of the Muslim states, apostasy carries the death penalty. And in other countries like Bangladesh and Tunisia, people who have left the faith are often attacked by extremists. Imtiaz shows me messages from one case he handles, a young Syrian atheist called Rana. She says she comes from a very religious family who live in Saudi Arabia. I think I first spoke to her actually about a year ago. She was having some troubles and she wanted to get out. After her family made her attend the Grand Mosque in Mecca, she secretly took this photo and sent it to a Facebook site for atheists, where it was posted. When she right. first did that, okay. when she was still in Saudi, that went completely viral. She's now on the run and has escaped as far as Turkey. Imtiaz's network is helping her as she's desperate. Hello? Hi. Hi. Rana, I'm Poppy. Hi, Poppy. How are you? Fine, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. You took a photo that said Atheist Republic. Yes, Atheist Republic, it's a website and uh, Facebook and Twitter for non-believer people, uh, for uh, ex-Muslim, ex-Christian, ex-Jewish, uh, any kind of religion. The Kaaba, the most yes. holiest place, was in the shot. Yes, two, two million or three million uh, Muslims <laughs> around me. I was really afraid, you know, if any someone know what I am doing here, they will uh, kill me in, in there. Why did you decide that t that morning or that day? What uh, made you post that photo? First message, I want to say I am not Muslim and I am not believer, but I am here. I don't have choice to come here. I can't tell my mother I am not Muslim. And I can't tell my father, uh, my family, I am not Muslim. Uh, my brother is very strict. And uh, one day when he think I have boyfriend in Saudi Arabia, he put uh, like a machine in my room to make a recording. So he put a secret tape in your machine? Yes, he come to my room and start to, to want to kill me. You have boyfriend, you know, it's haram, you want to, you know, this. Uh... So he tried to, he, he hit you, he beat you up? Yes. After my brother tried to kill me and he hit me, I tried to kill myself and I, wa I, wa I have this car here in my hand. What's the last thing that your dad or your brother said to you? They said, we will come to you, we will find you. So Rana, you're in Turkey now. What are your plans next? I want to go to country to protect me and to be safe in this country. And my family can't go for this country. Thank you so much for talking to us. Imtiaz's group and the Atheist Republic in America set up a crowdfunding site for Rana and raised $5,000 to help support her. In August, we flew out with Imtiaz to meet her. So Imtiaz and I are on our way to meet Rana for the very first time to see what Imtiaz can do to try and help her. We've asked her to meet us in Izmir, one of the largest port towns off the coast of the Mediterranean. Izmir is very close to the Greek borders, so very close to Europe. But actually, Rana is still in danger. Bye -bye. You look so different. So nice to finally meet you. <laughs> she's changed her appearance because she's nervous the local Syrian population may find out who she is. This is Rana's flat. It's through the crowdfunding that she's been able to pay rent on this place. Um, but she doesn't have long. I uh, have three weeks also. Three weeks left, yeah. So Rana, can you show me around? <laughs> yeah, I see here my stuff. Rana, all this stuff here, yeah. you packed with you from Saudi? Uh, no, stuff? only my abaya and uh, t-shirt. What's the plan? Uh, if I get any visa, I can go to Europe. She says her family knows she's in Turkey, but they don't know that she ran away because of her atheism. What do you think your parents will will do, like your dad or your brother will do if they find out you're an atheist? Kill me, maybe. 
Are you being serious? Yes. Over lunch, Rana shows me a video she recorded of her first day in Turkey. I was walking in the street and I see some people play music. And you were saying you wanted to dance in the street. What did you say? Your dream was yeah. I dream when I was in Saudi Arabia to dance in the street. <laughs> what are the dangers of living here? What are you really worried about? Uh, my family know I am here. If they know I am here, it's very dangerous because I think my brother will be come here. If he didn't kill me, he will back me to Saudi Arabia. And you've got the Syrian community here, so it's also very dangerous for you. Yes, because I will not speak with any Syrian people here. Uh, and I changed my look to don't look like, uh, like a Syrian girl or Arab girl. Imtiaz is trying to find a refugee charity that can help Rana in Turkey. But she's thinking of having herself smuggled illegally into Europe, despite the dangers. So we spoke to some people who work in this area. The problem with illegal is that because you're going through the ocean sometimes or through the truck, a lot of people die. You know that, I'm sure. But also you're a woman, and there's a very, very different danger for women. You know, I understand if you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice. If I don't have a choice, I will do it. I understand. When I was in Saudi Arabia, I dreamed to walk alone in the street, like a normal people, uh, like all girls dream about that in Saudi Arabia. Uh, walk alone without cover, without hijab, without, without niqab. Can you tell me why you're doing this? Why is it so important to you? I only want to live like a normal people, without afraid someone maybe you know you are a theist and kill you. Without afraid, your family it's no you are not a believer. Is there anything that you miss about Saudi Arabia? Uh, my family. Uh, I know they are now worried about me and some uh, my uh, big brother want to kill me, but uh, I miss my time with my family. I miss my uh, fam uh, mother food. And I hope one day I can meet to them. But not now. But not now, yes. When I come here the first day, I only walk, uh, stand up in the street and take a breath. <laughs> Finally! <laughs> I did it! Finally! <laughs> Another one! <laughs> Hi Rana, can you hear me? Hi, MTF. Hi. You sound, you sound exhausted. It's October now and Rana Skypes Imtiaz. She says she's getting desperate and has decided to be smuggled into Europe. Have you spoken to anyone about other routes out of Turkey? No, no. And you guys trust the people who are going to take you? No, or yes, or maybe? Yes, yes, we, we know the people who want to go. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Her heading down to Germany, there's a lot of risk there, but at the same time, there's also risk of things like self-harm. She's been feeling very um, suicidal and um, you can understand because she doesn't have a job, she's running out of money, she's got a month left on rent. A couple of weeks later, Rana starts sending us videos she takes on her phone. Tomorrow or after tomorrow I will go to Europe. Uh, I feel afraid and worried. Uh, it's dangerous trip, but uh, I don't have choice. I am waiting to leave to Kia now, but the weather will not help us. It's raining and it's bad. Uh, we see it's dangerous now. Uh, maybe our trip tomorrow, not today. Uh, I leave my house yesterday and I give the owner the key. I don't have house now. Uh, we are waiting now someone who will take us to the boat. I am afraid, nervous, worried. Uh, I don't know what will happen. The smugglers take her to a beach on the coast of Turkey. But that's all we hear from Rana for a while. After a few days, she makes contact again. So the last we heard from Rana was two days ago. I've just got messages come through on Facebook. She said that she was at the beach and four boats had set off for Greece. And she was supposed to be on the fifth boat. And apparently the moment she was supposed to get on that boat, the police came. Jinder Mahir, we are skipped for them. They search about 
prefer she. So it looks like she's going to be in Turkey for a while longer. In November, we get more videos from Rana. She's trying to cross into Europe once again. We will leave today at uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, we will leave Izmir to go to a place where we can take the boat and go to Jersey. They're driven to a beach and left there alone. The place here is terrible, fucking place. No one here. It was very cold and now we light on the fire to warm us up. The smugglers turn up and Rana secretly films as she hands over the money. One or two hours we will go to Jersey. You can see the left side. It's there. She's made it to a small Greek island first and then onto a boat to Athens. We are so happy. We are free to do what we want and how to do it. Over the next two months, Rana continues to send us updates. She travels through Macedonia, Serbia, Slovakia, Croatia, Austria, and finally into Germany. I am so happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> and I fly out to see her. So this is where Rana's ended up, in Cologne in Germany. It's New Year's Eve. She's in a refugee camp about an hour from here, and she's on her way to meet us now. Hi, Rana, it's Poppy. Can, can you hear me now? Hello? All right, I've seen you. Stay there, stay there. How are you? <laughs> You've made it. You left Saudi Arabia. Turkey. You left Turkey, Turkey. and now you're here. <laughs> What does it feel like? You're in this market, you're listening to this music. Dreaming, dreaming. You feel like, you feel here normal people. After everything that you've been through and everything that you've sacrificed, is it worth leaving yes, Saudi Arabia yes, yes. for this? I want to complete my study. Uh, I want to study nuclear physics or nuclear engineering. I know what's feeling when you live like a Muslim girl, but you are not. How many think about, uh, they want to kill themselves, they want to die. Rana has now applied for asylum in Germany. But many more people around the world face persecution, like Raif Badawi and Ashraf Fayyad, in prison in Saudi Arabia, charged with apostasy. Meanwhile, Imtia says that since we started filming with him last year, he receives four more cases every week. And his group, Faith to Faithless, is about to start a tour of British universities where ex-Muslims will come out and share their stories. Hello everyone and welcome. I don't have my own official intro yet, so for the time being I am stealing from the one and only apostate prophet. I'm really sorry about that. For those who don't know, my name is Aisha Muhammad, or you might recognize me as Infidel Noodle from platforms like TikTok and Twitter. I am a former Sunni Muslim and I spent about 20 years of my life believing in and following the teachings of Islam. I guess today I want to go over some of the reasons why I decided to leave Islam and why I decided to speak about that and publicly identify myself as an ex-Muslim. So for many years of my life, I grappled with my belief in Islam. I was genuinely convinced for a very, very long time that I was cursed or deficient or fundamentally flawed in some way because I did struggle with many Islamic teachings. For example, even as a child, it was very easy for me to identify that the marriage between a man in his 50s and a child was morally wrong. Now, this is, of course, not the sole reason why I left Islam, but as a child, this was something that even from a very early point stood out to me as being questionable. I also questioned other things, like why Allah was so obsessed with me marrying a Muslim man 
when he had given men the right to marry Christian and Jewish women. I couldn't help but wonder, why did Allah care more about a person's religious beliefs and their genitals when it came to women selecting a lifelong partner? Why couldn't the requirement for who I was allowed to marry come down to whether or not that person was a decent human being? In my late teenage years, I decided that I needed to restore my Iman. It was finally time for me to become a good Muslim woman and to put my criticisms and questions to rest once and for all. To achieve this, of course I consulted Allah's perfect message, his final word. So I read the Quran from cover to cover. Then I read it again and again. And each time I read it, the same things would jump out to me. Justifications for misogyny, justifications for homophobia, justifications for slavery, for violence, for a sick, disturbing obsession with disbelievers, the grueling and graphic descriptions of hell, how my skin would be roasted off in Jahannam, only to be rebuilt and roasted once again over and over for eternity, for the simple act of disbelieving. I think as a Muslim woman, it is much easier for us to read the Quran and recognize that there is something not right. For example, as women, the Quran explains that we are only to receive half the inheritance of what a man receives. We are expected to cover in order to prevent sexualization of our bodies from men. Now, not only is this sexist towards women, but it's also highly offensive towards men. To depict men as hypersexualized creatures incapable of controlling themselves in the presence of women is truly disturbing. This is a clear example of how rape culture is perpetuated. This is a clear example of victim blaming. As I continued to dive deeper into my studies of Islam, I began to consult the Hadith in great detail. This was a major tipping point for me. As anyone who has read the Hadith knows, there are some truly disturbing teachings in there. For example, a woman's testimony is considered to be worth half that of a man due to the deficiency of a woman's mind. We are considered fitna, a temptation, rather than a human being. There is a plethora of teachings advocating for the execution of apostates. The death penalty is, of course, also prescribed to people of the LGBTQ community if they are caught engaging in homosexual acts. Contained within the hadith itself was also complete ludicrousy. For example, Muhammad advises us to drink camel piss because apparently that's good for you. He also had other interesting pieces of advice to offer, such as dunking flies in your tea, as one wing may in fact have the cure to disease. As I reflected back on my Muslim upbringing, I began to realize that I'd been heavily indoctrinated through mechanisms of fear. I was taught about the grueling, excruciating torture in the grave that I would experience if I was not a good Muslim believer. This is a very sick and twisted thing to teach a very young child. There also came a time where I had to confront the fact that there was a basic lack of evidence for some of the things taught to me within Islam. For example, I had wholeheartedly believed in the fact that Muhammad split the moon once upon a time and that this was considered a miracle. However, when I actually decided to research and assess this evidence for myself, I soon realized that there was no evidence for this at all. It wasn't long before I realized that the barbaric and inhumane teachings of Islam were still taking place and affecting the lives of millions of people in this day and age. In 2021, there are still 12 countries that can execute you legally simply because you apostatized from Islam. People are still being lashed, imprisoned, tortured, and even killed simply for belonging to the LGBTQ community. It is painstakingly obvious that we are dealing with a significant, blatant violation of human rights on a global scale being justified in the name of Islam. Because many ex-Muslims still reside in Muslim-majority countries that hand out these barbaric punishments, it is almost impossible for them to find an avenue to speak up freely. When ex-Muslims are not being imprisoned, tortured, and killed, we still face other forms of backlash. Many of us are ostracized from our own families, from our communities, we are disowned, we are cast aside, we are rejected, we are depicted as evil, we are dehumanized and degraded left, right and center, and according to Islam, that is all perfectly acceptable. Now, if I'm being completely honest, I never really planned on getting involved with ex-Muslim activism in the way that I am today. It all started during the COVID-19 lockdown period. I found myself so incredibly bored that I ended up downloading an app I swore I would stay away from. 
TikTok. I don't really remember why I chose to do this, but one day I decided to look up the ex-Muslim hashtag on TikTok and I was really heartbroken to find that there wasn't much there. So on a whim, I decided, hey, how about I post my own TikTok video and see what happens? I called it Things I Hear as an Ex-Muslim. And I was shocked when I soon realized that within a matter of minutes, the video had gone viral. It had accumulated nearly 40,000 views uh, only a few minutes after I posted it. I really didn't understand how to process this. I certainly wasn't ready for that. But what surprised me more than anything was the amount of backlash coming from Muslims. The amount of hatred, the amount of violent threats and disturbing descriptions of what people wanted to do with me simply because I was identifying publicly as an ex-Muslim. This was one of the main things that pushed me to keep going. Seeing how desperately people wanted me to remain silent only encouraged me to speak up even louder. So I did. I kept making TikTok videos and I started sharing my voice on Twitter. It wasn't long before I was contacted by ex-Muslims all around the world who told me how inspired they were to see other people like them speaking up. And it made me think back to my own childhood when I saw myself as deficient, when I didn't know that it was possible to be an ex-Muslim, when I didn't know that it was okay to disbelieve. I thought back to when I didn't realize that it was perfectly normal and acceptable to want to think objectively, critically, and for yourself, as opposed to within the constraints of a 7th century ideology. I thought back to how lonely and scared I was in those days when I didn't realize that other ex-Muslims existed. I remembered what a huge relief it was when I finally started to discover other ex-Muslims. All of these people putting themselves out there, being the brave, courageous characters that they were and speaking up on behalf of those who couldn't do the same. And I decided, you know, maybe that could be me. Maybe I could be that for someone else. Maybe I can empower people to be who they truly are. And maybe I can demonstrate to others that it is okay to leave Islam, that it is okay to be an ex-Muslim. So I decided to keep going and eventually I landed here on YouTube. Today I look back and I remember all the people who have reached out to me from around the world and it pushes me and encourages me to keep going. And so I've decided that I will not stop doing this until ex-Muslims around the world are no longer persecuted, ostracized, killed, imprisoned, tortured, simply for being who we are, simply for wanting to disbelieve in a barbaric ideology, simply for wanting to think freely, to love freely, to embrace our individuality. The normalization of religious dissent, particularly within the context of Islam, is crucial for the progression of our society. And that is why I am not going to stop. I have a question for you. Why do groups of ex-Muslims even exist? I don't see groups of ex-atheists, ex-Christians, ex-Jews. So it does baffle me why there are groups of um, ex-Muslims talking online about Islam. Just move on with your life. I don't think you can ever expect an ex to speak well of you. Oh, thanks for asking. It's actually very simple. Reason number one is that Jews and Christians usually don't make such a huge deal of people not believing in their religion. I'm sure you know that. Whereas in a Muslim society, it is normal that you are shunned and that leaving Islam affects your entire life. You are mistreated very much. Reason number two is that Islam is very oppressive and it is, it is very hard to really get rid of the burden of Islam. Reason number three is that Jews and Christians are mostly not of the opinion that their ex-believers should be persecuted and lynched and killed whereas that is very much the case in Muslim society and if you leave Islam then you can't just go on with your life you know when you leave Islam it is very likely that you will probably have very strong opinions about your ex which is Islam because that ex actually wants you to be mistreated to be shunned and to be killed I'm sure you know about the apostasy laws within Islam. I think it's very much a self-own to ask why there are so many people who call themselves ex-Muslims, why are there are not many people who call themselves ex-Jews or ex-Christians. I mean, it can't really be that all these ex-Muslims somehow have a problem. Maybe it's because Islam has something that makes ex-Muslims particularly angry about their former religion. I mean, I don't see how you cannot think that through. That's, that is very much a self-own or an owning of Islam. But thank you so much. Hope that answers the question. Stay away from Islam. In the age of the internet, there are so many different threats that are being posed to Islam. For example, ex-Muslims who decide to speak up and share their thoughts and stories. There's also the more obvious ones, like the fact that people are now able to point out logical and scientific inconsistencies and spread this to a wider audience. But I think there's another threat that we don't talk about nearly enough. How often do we hear the phrase, 
Islam is the fastest growing religion. Alhamdulillah, so many people are embracing Islam. But when people speak about this rapid increase, they never follow it up with the facts. So often they fail to mention the fact that Islam's growth is actually relying on one particular thing birth rates. To put it simply, statistics are showing us that Muslim women have higher fertility rates in comparison to non-Muslim women. We see this reflected in data provided by Pew Research Center, which demonstrates that this is the case on a global scale. If we look at a more localized example like Australia, we can also see that our census data is reflecting and substantiating the same thing. So ultimately, what we know from this is that Islam's growth is relying on one particular group women. In the West, Islam relies very heavily upon Muslim women to entice non-Muslim women to consider and embrace Islam. And of course, once that happens, those same women are then encouraged to go looking for a Muslim husband. We can see this reflected in real-life examples of former converts who are now ex-Muslims. After speaking with I learnt about how, when she became a Muslim, she was constantly faced with the pressure of finding a husband, settling down, and fulfilling her role as a good Muslim woman. Also explained to me that this went as far as her dropping out of college after finding a husband just so that she could have Muslim children and fulfill the role of a wife. We see very similar things in cases like Deborah's story. What I'm hearing from both of these women is that the one thing that really, really drew them into Islam and made them want to stay was other women, their kindness, their generosity, their relatability, and the way that they were able to paint Islam as something that women would love. So once again, we're seeing the exact same trend here. Islam relying on women to secure its growth. If you grew up a Muslim woman like me, I wanna ask you this. How many of you were told that you couldn't move out of home, couldn't travel overseas, or do anything of the sort without a mahram? Now, if you had male siblings, how did your freedom compare to theirs? Growing up in a Western country, I recognized that I had the privilege of secular freedoms to assist me in that department. As we see in places like Saudi Arabia, the requirement for a mahram is even reflected within legislation itself, taking that degree of control to a whole different level. Muslim women are taught that we need a mahram. We need that caretaker, that protector, that person who has that degree of responsibility over us. Islam places women in a position where we are forced to become reliant upon men. Be honest with me. How many of you who are or were a Muslim at one point thought to yourself, I need to find a husband so that I can be free? I know that there was certainly a long period of time in my life where I was thinking like that. As many of us are aware, verse 434 clearly describes the requirement for women to be obedient wives. We are even told that we can be subject to physical discipline if we don't fulfill this obligation. In other words, the Quran itself is enabling and justifying gendered domestic violence. Then of course this is further substantiated within the Hadith. For example, we see that Muhammad himself explained that a man will not be asked why he beat his wife. We see Aisha herself remarking on the bad and bruised body of a fellow Muslim believer. We see Aisha explaining that she has never seen anyone suffering as much as the believing women. Now, of course, Dawah boys will tell us that even though the Quran explicitly explains that we are to receive half the inheritance of a man, this is in fact good for us, and Islam treats us like queens. They tell us that a man is responsible for caring and looking after his wife and children, while a woman's money remains her own. Of course, what they conveniently exclude is the fact that this depiction of men as caretakers does nothing but maintain archaic heteronormative values and roles. In reality, what this is actually doing is undermining the ability of a woman to prosper and thrive independently. This degrades the capability of women as independent human beings and places unnecessary strain on men. The sexism and misogyny in this notion is so blatant. Muslim apologists will try to tell us that because men are required to provide women with a dowry in exchange for marriage, this explains the immense value of a woman. Truthfully and realistically, what the concept of a dowry actually does is make an attempt to quantify our worth as women our worth as human beings. This depicts us as property, as an item that can be exchanged for gifts or money. Islam wants to pretend that women are something upon which you can place a price tag, when in reality, we are priceless. 
When we look at the concept of marriage, in addition to the fact that we can only marry Muslim men, there's also the issue that Muslim men can take four wives, whereas we are only permitted to have one husband. Within that marriage itself, Islam wants to pretend that we are fields, something upon which men can put forth their righteousness however and whenever they please. Islam tells us that if we deny our husbands the sexual gratification that we will be cursed by the malaika, the angels. Islam even goes so far as to say that our silence equates to our consent. How can we even pretend that Islam isn't paving the way to marital rape? There's also the fact that Islam teaches us to shield our bodies away from the world. Islam teaches us that we are aura, that we are fitna. People will try to argue that Islamic modesty standards and requirement for hijab are also enforced upon men, but of course they'll conveniently exclude the fact that the degree to which men are expected to cover pales in comparison to the expectations enforced upon women. Islam tries to pretend that this is a way to prevent us from being sexualized and abused. Islamic apologists will tell us that we can be compared to wrapped and unwrapped candy, that we are jewels which need to be shielded in layers of fabric. All this done under the disguise of modesty. And of course, they conveniently fail to mention the incredibly high rates of sexual assault occurring in Muslim countries where women are covering. As we know, this even includes the holy city of Mecca itself. Apologists will brush over the implications of purity culture in practice. They will make no mention of the fact that this paves the way, justifies and substantiates rape culture and victim blaming. Islam tells us that women can never be successful leaders. Islam degrades our intelligence. It depicts periods as dirty and impure. It tells us that we are ungrateful. We are evil omens that can be compared to animals and property. Islam very clearly articulates that the majority of women are destined for hell. The fact of the matter is this. Islam is a religion created by men for men. There were no female prophets in Islam. The Quran itself largely fails to even speak to women directly. To all my Muslim and ex-Muslim sisters around the world, I want you to know this. The author of the Quran may have failed to even bother speaking to you directly, but today I'm here to speak specifically to you. As I hope you can see, Islam relies on our obedience, our oppression, our submission. You deserve more than a religion that seeks to degrade and control every aspect of your life as a female. You deserve more than to have your freedom restricted and dictated by the sexual perversions of a dead 7th century man. In the face of our autonomy, our empowerment, and our liberation, Islam quivers with fear. There are dower boys out there who will try desperately to emotionally manipulate you and guilt trip you into conforming. They will try to threaten and intimidate you should you dare to dissent. Should you dare to take off your hijab, make your own choices, and step out of the carefully curated box that is Islam. These men so desperately want to fight for maintaining an ideology that gives them a sense of authority they otherwise would not possess. Don't let them. You and you alone are the only person who speaks for yourself. And just as these dower boys shed tears in the face of our liberation, so too will Islam. If we stand in solidarity to support each other's liberation, we are stronger than any patriarchal ideology out there that seeks to control us. We need to support each other's right to disbelieve, to dissent, to make our own choices, to live our lives according to no one's terms and conditions except our own. So to all the women out there around the world who are watching this, Hear me loud and clear when I say that the greatest threat to Islam today, right now, is you. I'll be the first to admit that the Quran contains peaceful teachings. Unfortunately, the peaceful teachings were abrogated or canceled by Allah's commands to violently subjugate the entire world. But that doesn't stop Muslim apologists from quoting the abrogated peaceful verses and pretending that Islam still calls for peace. So it's good to be ready with Muslim commentaries that explain that the peaceful verses have been abrogated. Don't be duped by Dawagandists. But there's an additional problem here, namely that we don't always have easy access to the commentaries. Quran commentaries are often abridged so that you're not necessarily getting the full picture when you read an English translation. Consider 
an example. Hi, David. I am wondering if you could show us the picture of the Tafsir Ibn Kathir commentary on the abrogation of Surah 2, 256, please, because I cannot find it nowhere what you have read and said on this in one of your old videos. I need a photo of this important information to use it for my future debates with Muslims to expose the true teachings of Islam. Thank you, David. A picture you want, a picture you shall have. All right, so I've quoted the tafsir of Ibn Kathir at various times to show that Surah 2, verse 256 of the Quran, there is no compulsion in religion, one of the handful of verses that are used to show that Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance, was abrogated by later commands to violently subjugate the world. But if you go to the online version of Ibn Kathir, or if you purchase the 10-volume Darus Salaam edition, you won't find the passage I quote. So, where am I getting it? Well, again, the English translations are abridged, so different translators leave out certain things. This is part three of the al Firdaus edition of Ibn Kathir. Let's read a bit of what the Darus Salaam edition left out. Ibn Kathir gives a couple of different historical backgrounds for the verse. We'll start here. Muhammad ibn Asak narrated that Ibn Abbas said, It was revealed with regard to a man from the tribe of Bani Salim ibn Auf called al Husseini, whose two sons converted to Christianity, but he was himself a Muslim. He told the Prophet, Shall I force them to embrace Islam? They insist on Christianity. Hence, Allah revealed this verse. So, his sons left Islam and converted to Christianity. Smart boys. Should he force them to return to Islam? Of course not. There is no compulsion in religion. What a wonderful message. Unfortunately, the message didn't last long because Allah changes his mind a lot. But this verse is abrogated by the verse of fighting you shall be called to fight against a people given to great warfare, then you shall fight them, or they shall surrender. al fath that's Surah 48, verse 16. Allah also says, O Prophet Muhammad, strive hard against the disbelievers and the hypocrites, and be harsh against them. at tawbah that's Surah 9, verse 73. And he says, O you who believe, Fight those of the disbelievers who are close to you and let them find harshness in you. And know that Allah is with those who are the al-mutakin, the pious. Surah 9, verse 123. So, the peaceful verse was abrogated by calls for violence. What are the final marching orders of the Quran? Therefore, all people of the world should be called to Islam, if any one of them refuses to do so, or refuses to pay the jizya, head tax imposed by a Muslim state on all non-Muslims living under the protection of a Muslim government, they should be fought till they are killed. The final marching orders are to call the entire world to Islam and to kill anyone who doesn't convert to Islam or pay the jizya. So, people ask, why are so many terrorist attacks carried out in the name of Islam? Why are there so many Islamic terrorist groups? Why are there forced conversions? Why are there blasphemy laws in Muslim countries? Why is there a death penalty for apostates? Muslim apologists reply, No, no, my good man. None of that has anything to do with Islam. The Quran says that there is no compulsion in religion. That's what Islam teaches. All of the bloodshed and massacres are due to a simple misunderstanding of Islam. Unfortunately for Muslim apologists, their own sources say that the peaceful teachings were revealed in certain situations and that they only applied in certain circumstances. These peaceful teachings were later abrogated by commands to violently subjugate the entire world. So James, you can add that passage to your collection I'll put the passage up on the screen without any underlining so you can take some screenshots.
this is a power of religion, there's a reason to it. Yeah? 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 There's a reason why there's a capital punishment. Yeah? 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 Abrogation refers to Allah's practice of canceling certain verses in the Quran and providing better verses. But this is a strange practice since the Quran is supposedly Allah's eternal speech. Why would some parts of Allah's eternal speech be worse than other parts? In response to my recent video about the abrogation of Surah 2 verse 256, there is no compulsion in religion, a Muslim commented, I'm Muslim. I always hated the idea of abrogated verses in the Quran, and why would God contradict himself? I don't believe in abrogated verses, but I noticed a tune of hate in you. I hope you seek the truth, not loyalty to your ideas, and I'm sorry if the media won't give Christians a chance to speak without called Islamophobic. I think that is one of the reasons why the West hate Islam. Why do they make it so easy? All right, Ibn Said, so you recognize that there's a problem with the doctrine of abrogation. You recognize that if Allah is canceling certain verses and replacing them with other verses that contradict the original verses, then Allah's eternal speech contains contradictions. Your solution is to reject the doctrine of abrogation. You say that you don't believe in it. But in rejecting the doctrine of abrogation, you just became an apostate, my friend. Congratulations, let me show you how you just left Islam. The doctrine of abrogation comes directly from the Quran. Let's read Surah 2, verse 106. We'll read a few different translations so that we'll be sure to understand it. None of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar. Knowest thou not that God hath power over all things? Whatever a verse, revelation, do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring a better one or similar to it. Know you not that Allah is able to do all things? Whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? And for whatever verse we abrogate or cast into oblivion, we bring a better or the like of it. Knowest thou not that God is powerful over everything? Whatever verse we may annul or cause thee to forget, we will bring a better one than it, or one like it. Dost thou not know that God is mighty over all? Whatever verses we cancel or cause thee to forget, we bring a better or its like. Knowest thou not that God hath power over all things? So Allah abrogates or cancels certain verses and replaces them with similar verses or better verses. Ibn Said, you've already said that you hate the doctrine of abrogation, which is somewhat ironic since you later accuse me of hate. But the only one hating abrogation here is you, Ibn Said. I absolutely love it because it helps me expose the Quran. All we have to do is look at the historical background of Surah 2, verse 106. We find the historical background in Al-Wahiri's Asbab al-Nazul. Nothing of our revelation, even a single verse, do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we bring in place one better or the like thereof. Surah 2, verse 106. The commentators of the Quran said, the idolaters said, do you not see that Muhammad commands his companions with something and then forbids them from the same and commands them to the exact opposite? One day he says something and the following day he retracts it. The Quran is nothing but the speech of Muhammad who has invented it. It is a speech that contradicts itself. Allah exalted is he therefore revealed this verse. And when we put a revelation in place of another, Surah 16, verse 101, and also, nothing of our revelation, even a single verse, do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we bring in place one better or the like thereof. 
So the pagans noticed that Muhammad kept contradicting himself. He would walk out one day and tell his followers, Allah commands you to do X. Then he would walk out the next day and tell them, Allah commands you not to do X. The pagans mocked him for this. They said, there's no way this is the eternal speech of Allah. It doesn't make any sense for Allah's eternal speech to contradict itself like this. This is nothing but the speech of Muhammad who has invented it. And Allah responded by revealing that when he abrogates a verse, he brings something similar or something even better which does absolutely nothing to answer the objection. His eternal speech still contains contradictions. Notice, Ibn Said, you agree with the pagans on this one. I agree with the pagans on this one. They were right. It makes no sense for Allah's eternal speech to be filled with contradictions. This is yet another reason that Muhammad was the most obvious false prophet in history. Of course, Surah 2, verse 256, there was no compulsion in religion, was eventually abrogated, and the pagans were forced to convert to Islam. They were forced to follow a man that they knew was a false prophet. But there's no sword at our throats, Ibn Said. We're free to reject the Quran, since we both agree that it's not the word of God. We're free to expose Muhammad as the hopelessly moronic false prophet that he was. You've already admitted that you find the doctrine of abrogation completely ridiculous, Ibn Said. Now you should admit that you've abrogated your belief in Islam. Where is Allah? Where is Allah? This is such a foolish question. Where is Allah? Where is Allah is an extremely important issue. Where is Allah? Where is Allah? Is this is such a foolish question. Where is Allah? Where is Allah is an extremely important issue. He is over his throne. Over his throne.